Can we be pure and holy and righteous on our own? Is that something that we can do in our own power? No, it's not something that we can do in our own power, but God's expecting us to be holy. So if he's expecting us to be holy, there must be a way that he can make that happen in our lives. We'll go ahead and get started tonight. Uh, we're here to talk about the journey of discipleship. And when I think about um, uh, my own life and, and coming to Christ and the, the transition, the difficulty and the growing, uh, the things I'll be sharing tonight, I, I in many ways wish somebody had shared with me. It surely would have helped me a lot to, to come to know the Lord. Uh, this key scripture uh, that we have here is uh, found in John chapter 3, I'm sorry, 8. John chapter 8, verses 31 through 32. If ye continue, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And uh, so we can be his uh, disciples, and how we do that is continuing in his word. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Rodney Keister, and I'm a missionary with Evangelism Mission the founder and director of Evangelism Mission, as well as Freedom Gospel. Uh, neither of our ministries are about being part of any religious organization, uh, but it's rather about sharing the full gospel of Jesus Christ through the scriptures and revelation. Uh, what I mean by that is God's inspiration, his leadership, his uh, leading and guiding and directing. Uh, while we are connected to a, a denomination called God's Missionary Church, we're not here representing them as a whole or representing that system of, of church. We are here simply to share the gospel and to help us uh, help anyone uh, to walk closer with the Lord. Uh, my daughter Gabrielle is here, uh, seated up front, and uh, she's also a missionary evangelist, mostly working in the Indianapolis uh, uh, area of Indiana, and then she also takes occasional mission trips and ministers abroad. Uh, she's also our mission editor and whatever else we need done, uh, sometimes she's helping out with those things. She also coordinates a lot of people to uh, uh, go out on the streets, and so we would consider her our volunteer coordinator for the Indianapolis area. Some of the things that we plan to cover in this seminar is knowing our hearts are right with God. If we're going to really be a true disciple, that's going to be one of the first steps is getting our heart right with God. Uh, developing a solid walk with the Lord. It's one thing to come into a relationship with Him, and it's another thing to learn to walk with Him. And that's a growing experience. And then uh, the uh, last thing that we're looking to talk about is uh, learning to closely follow Jesus, and uh, which is also different than just walking with God in our personal relationship, but following Jesus and the things that he did and uh, what he's wanting us to do. Starting out, uh, what is a disciple? In Luke chapter 14, uh, there's some scripture here that helps us in that area. Luke 14, verse 25. And there, were, and there went great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me, and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now Matthew, in the book of Matthew chapter 10, uh, the same basic concept in Scripture, but I think it also helps to explain a little bit deeper up above. It said that, that unless you hate your father, mother, or wife, and what is he actually meaning by that? He doesn't uh, teach hatred, but we can see down here in, in Matthew 10 and verse 37, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And that's what's being said up above. Uh, it's using the word hate as a, a word to describe the opposite of, of uh, love greater than he. Uh, so in other words, we're to love God supremely. And uh, even if that means that, that some would go a different direction, they may forsake us. And we're not going to love anyone more than we're going to love God. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. So what does it mean to be a disciple? Well, it's not simply meaning one who is saved. It's not just a person that has come to, to, to a place of confession, repentance of their sins. 
but it's one who has uh, been disciplined. Uh, dis disciplined means under control. Uh, secondly, a disciple is one who's brought under the control of Jesus. And so if we're going to be disciplined, if we're going to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ, we're going to be uh, under his control, under his leadership. And so may God help us to do that. We want to be under the full leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we want to have our heart made right with God. Uh, how is it that we can uh, know our heart is right with God? Well, I think in order to know our heart is right to God, we need to start with some basic things. And, you know, one of the biggest problems with understanding how to be right with God and understanding how to walk with God is having a proper understanding of uh, these basic concepts we're going to share. Looking at Revelation chapter 21 and verse 27. Uh, what does God expect of us? And there shall be in no wise, and there shall in no wise enter into it. But any worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. In First Peter 1 and verse 16 it says, be, uh, uh, Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. So what does God expect of us? He expects us to be holy, to be pure, to be righteous. And that's not something we can do on our own, is it? Can we be pure and holy and righteous on our own? Is that something that we can do in our own power? No, it's not something that we can do in our own power. But God's expecting us to be holy. So if he's expecting us to be holy, there must be a way that he can make that happen in our lives. Uh, now, understanding uh, the opposite of holy is, is sin, is, is living in sin. Uh, and a proper understanding of sin is so important. Uh, you know, uh, Chris and James, if we could grasp that concept in Gabrielle, understanding exactly what sin is, it helps us to be able to realize you know, when we're failing God. And so we need to look here at these verses of Scripture. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, it says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So in other words, whoever is, is committing sin, they're breaking God's law. And if we're breaking God's law, uh, this is sin, because sin is the, is the breaking of God's law. So that's one type of sin. Uh, what is the law? All the Word of God. Of course, I mean, we think about the law being the commandment specifically, but really all of God's Word becomes His law for us. Uh, and so God can help us to not break His laws. The second type of sin uh, is what I would refer to as a sin of uh, omission or neglect. So one is actually doing something and, and doing something that's wrong. The other is, is neglecting to do what is right. And the scripture here tells us in James chapter 4 and verse 17, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and to doeth it not, to him it is sin. And so if we know that something's right that we need to be doing, but yet we're not willing to do it, then that becomes sin. And so understanding those two types of, of sin is very important. Because a lot of people think of the, of the first one up here, uh, you know, whosoever committed sin is transgressed the law. That's pretty understandable. You know, if you're breaking God's word, we understand that's sin. But the second one is one that's often missed by so many, even some very well-meaning Christians, they, they, they don't realize that to neglect to do what is right is also sin. And uh, now if the Lord, as we said before, is expecting us to be holy, for I am holy, and look at the verse that we looked at before, uh, no wise enter in, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie. So this is what anybody... That, that is in sin, we can't enter into heaven. It's only those that have their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Where well, our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life when he has brought change to our life. And uh, that's an awesome privilege to have our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So what does God think of even just committing one sin? You know, if we're going to be a proper disciple of, of the Lord, we have to understand what does God think about sin. And uh, we look here in James chapter 2 and verse 10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So in other words, if we, we did our very best and, and uh, you know, out of the Ten Commandments and we're, we're just failing in one of those points, according to the Word of God, we're, we're guilty of all of them. And that one of the best ways I can illustrate this, if you can imagine if I had a glass pane up here, I had a, a piece of glass, and I were to draw a circle in that glass, and then I would divide that in ten pieces of pie, and I were to take a hammer and smash just one of those pieces of pie on that sheet of glass. Am I going to break just that one, or is that whole, sh that whole panel going to shatter? What do you think? If you take a hammer to a piece of glass, do you just break one little spot, or is the, the whole thing just shatter? It's going to shatter the whole thing. And that's the same thing that happens with, with sin. Uh, sin breaks uh, you know, the, 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 the relationship with God. It, 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 it uh, keeps us separated from God. 
And so we're guilty of all if we're even offending in so much as one point. Well, it seems like God has a very high standard of, of, uh, of his holiness and what he wants us to do. Sin is very serious. And in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8, it says, He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And here's the glorious news. The Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So while sin, if we're living in sin, it says we're of the devil. So that's a pretty serious matter. But Jesus Christ was manifested to break that bondage and to give us deliverance. The Bible also tells us in, in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I say praise God that we can have that eternal gift and uh, we can, uh, those wages of sin uh, that, uh, that, that, that we would end up in death because of that, a spiritual death, that can be uh, resurrected, that can be rectified. And we can praise God for that. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we could probably all quote this, uh, I would imagine. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And, uh, you know, this is probably the, one of the most quoted or most known verses in Scripture. It's a glorious truth uh, that God so loved this world, praise God. He so loved this world that he gave his only begotten Son, praise God. He gave his only Son that we would not have to perish but that we could have everlasting life. But one of the mistakes that happens in the minds of men and women, using men as a neutral term, is right here, this word believeth. Whosoever believeth in him would have everlasting life. So, you know, what does this mean? Just to, to believe that Jesus exists, to believe that he's the Son of God, that saves us? Uh, what does it really mean scripturally to believe? Well, uh, in uh, the, uh, um, the Greek reference here in a strong concordance, the word believeth in Greek is pisio, and it's used in the New Testament of the conviction and trust to which a man is impelled by a certain inner and higher prerogative in the law of the soul to trust in Jesus or God as being able to aid in obtaining or doing something of saving faith. It means you will believe in Jesus Christ with all of your heart, soul, and mind to a point of being changed within. And so that word believe is a whole lot more than just uh, our average word believe in the English language. It's a whole lot deeper than that. Uh, it's, it's, it's believing to the place of transformation in our life, allowing the Holy Spirit to change us. So that brings us to the next point that I want to make. And again, we're, we're building up to how to be a true disciple of God is what is true salvation? Uh, when we think about salvation, well, salvation is deliverance from sin and its consequences. Now, one of the things that happens so often is is uh, most people think of salvation as deliverance from the consequences of sin. And that's kind of their, their concept. It's deliverance from sin, the consequences of sin, not sin and the consequences. And the coming to peace and reconciliation with God. A salvation that still left sin in command was not a salvation in any sense. And so this is a very important thing to understand when, when trying to walk with God and, and getting right with God is that God delivers us from the bondage of sin. Amen. He delivers us from the bondage of sin, not just the consequences. Many people's faith in Jesus Christ is to believe that they've been delivered from the consequences of sin, death, and hell. And, but yet, they, they've not had deliverance from sin. Now, is God so great that he could take us on to heaven, and, but you're not, you're not great enough to, to really deliver us from our sins here? I mean, think about that. God is all-powerful. He has the ability to deliver us from our sins right now. Not just something that would happen when we transition from this world to the next. So salvation is deliverance from sin and its consequences. And through that we come to peace and reconciliation with God. So how is it that we can get right with God? If we're going to be a true disciple, we're going to have to get right with God. Uh, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It is only by Jesus and Jesus alone that we can be born again. He said in John 14 and verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, not one person, nobody, cometh unto the Father but by me. The only way for salvation is through Jesus Christ. 
So if we're going to be born again, now that word born again means a whole lot of things to different people. Uh, but the reality of it is, is that we have been transformed. You know, we go from, from uh, out of the womb of, of a life of sin, and we, we are changed and transformed and born into the family of God. <clears throat> so how is it that we can get right with God? One, we need to confess our sins. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, confess our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And uh, so there's the foundation. That's the very beginning point. Now, again, here's a spot that, that, that I would say the average professing Christian confesses sin to God. You know, that's, that's a pretty common thing. Um, and uh, uh, the fact of the matter is, is if all we do is confess, see, the, the average understanding in the Christian world is points number one and point number three, that we need to confess and that we need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But this part in the middle seems to be missing in so many church circles and in so many people that profess the, the name of Jesus Christ. It's like, uh, how, many of you, how many of you ever ate a sandwich before? All of us, right? Now, I don't know about you, but when I make a sandwich, I, I have a piece of bread. I have something in the middle, whether it's peanut butter and jelly or, or meat or, or uh, you know, something in the middle, and then another piece of bread. It's a sandwich, right? That's what makes up a whole sandwich. If all I had was two pieces of bread, is that a sandwich? No, it's not. And so what we have is, is, is we today in the Christian circles is we have this, this artificial sandwich. Uh, people have taken two parts of, of Christianity's salvation and they've jammed it together and they made a jam sandwich because there's nothing in the middle. Just two pieces of bread smacked together. And so they, they got the confession part down and they live their lives in continuous confession, but they never get to this place where their heart has been truly repentant. And so what happens is you get this vicious circle going on. You get this vicious circle of, of, of all the time, continuously. Oh, you did something wrong, now you've got to be continuously to confess. You, you did something wrong, you're continuing to confess. You're continuing to confess. You do, something wrong, confess. Something wrong, confess. And the fact of the matter is, if this would happen in the life, there shouldn't be that pattern of, of sin and confession on a constant basis. And uh, so when we think about that, I mean, let me illustrate that just a little bit better. Now, I'm going to have uh, Gabrielle step up here for just a second. And uh, if uh, it will get you to not to be in the light, so you're not blind, just go ahead and cross over. All right, so now I would never, never do this, but uh, if, if I were to, uh, uh, you know, just purposely slug my daughter upside the face, now I wouldn't do that. But if I were to make a fist and hit her, and then I would say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry for doing that. Uh, well, you know, would you forgive me? And, and somehow she found the ability to say I, she'd forgive me. And then I went and I, I did it again. And then I said, oh, would you forgive me? Would you, I'm so sorry that I did that. And I kept doing this pattern. At what point do you think she's going to realize I'm not sorry if I keep on doing it? Or you can have a seat. You know, the, the reality is, is, is if, if we continue to go back to that, that sin and, and, and we haven't fully repented. Because see, the Bible says repentance is what? It is for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. See, it's required for salvation. Not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And it is so important. Jesus preached a lot of things. But look what he said in Mark chapter 1 and verse 15. And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now those are the words of Jesus Christ. Jesus told us that we need to repent. So if all we do is that part, he says, and believe the gospel. So if we do the believing part down here, you know, we believe on Jesus Christ, but there's no repentance in the midst of it. We have not even done what Jesus told us to do, to have salvation. There has to be a repentance. Now this repentance for godly sorrow work in repentance. Uh, it's difficult to probably wrap our minds around what is godly sorrow? What is, what is a sorrow that is so great as it would be referred to as a godly sorrow? One of the illustrations I used to illustrate that is, is a, a boy uh, that was playing, uh, kicking a ball in the house. How many of you ever kicked the ball in the house and got in trouble for it? I did that. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, this boy, this boy is not me in this illustration, but uh, this boy was kicking around and mom heard him kicking the ball and she, you know, don't kick the ball in the house, you might break something. And, 
And uh, so, you know, she left him know, nice, you know, she didn't, didn't punish him or anything, just told him to stop doing it. And so he stopped. But the ball was sitting right in front of him. And it just kind of got the best of him. And, and, and he just couldn't, couldn't contain himself any longer. And he said, well, I'm going to kick it one more time. And he hauled back and he kicked the ball again. This time it went flying through the air. It struck the china closet with, with all the precious dishes in it and the glass doors. It smashed the glass door. The vibration of all that caused the china to slide, to smash right through the glass shelves. And it destroyed half of the china in the china closets. And this terrible noise from all this happening. And, and, and all of a sudden, you know, little Billy, the boy's name was Billy. And, and, and Billy just drops to his knees and he starts crying. And he, he's, he's just broken. And he's hurt. And his mom comes running in. He's not hurt from the break of the glass. He's hurt for what he's done. And he's not crying because he's afraid he's going to get a spanking or he's in trouble. You see, there's a deeper hurt that's happening here. He is crying. And he is hurt on the inside because he, he didn't listen to his mom and now he has broken a very precious thing. But you see, that china in the china closet was so important to his mother because it was the last gift that Billy's father gave his mother before he went off to the war and he died in that war. That china could never be replaced. It was the last gift his mother ever received. And Billy broke it because of his disobedience. Billy was weeping and crying and hurt and, and, and just broken. Why? Because he realized the damage that he's done and how much that precious gift meant to his mom. You see, that way that he felt was, was the closest way I can describe a godly sorrow. We're, we're so sorry for what we've done, we actually hurt. It hurts on the inside because we've hurt the one that we love. Billy hurt his mother because he didn't obey and that caused damage. And, and now Billy is hurt on the inside because he hurt his mom. And he's very sad. It's a godly sorrow and it's work in repentance. Do you think after that experience, you know, his mom came over, she wasn't there ready to whip him. But she's seen and she realized how broken Billy was and she wrapped her arms around him and forgave him. And he's crying out, Mom, he's, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'll never do that again. Do you think that Billy, after seeing the damage he did, that if his mom was able to save half of the china in there and she got it repaired and fixed it back up, do you think Billy's ever going to kick the ball at that glass again? Do you think he would do that? No, he wouldn't. And the reason he wouldn't do it is because he was so broken and, and hurt over the things that he had done. What happened? Why did Billy not want to ever kick that ball again? Because there was a godly sorrow that worked repentance in his heart. And he would never want to do that again. And see, this is the key thing to come to Christ. is not only that we tell God that we're guilty of breaking his commandments, but that we have a spirit of repentance that brings us to salvation. That, that, that godly sorrow is what works repentance we are so sorry for what we've confessed that we're broken on the inside and that brings us to Christ. Now, we can actually do this last part. What must I do to be saved? And he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. When we've confessed and our heart is truly repentance, we can have a faith that believes in Jesus Christ and a transformation takes place in our lives to such a degree that we don't naturally go right back into the ways of sin. How do we get right with God? We need to confess and repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shall be saved. Now, what are some of the fruits of being right with God? You know, if this really happens in our lives, if we've confessed, repented, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and we've been saved, there's going to be fruits of that. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8 and verse 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. You know, so the Spirit bears witness. We have a witness from God. And let me pause there for just a moment. You know, God's presence can be felt. We can sense and realize God's presence. But just because we feel God's presence doesn't necessarily mean that we've reached the place of salvation. A lot of times people have come to the front of a church and they've prayed and we, we pray around the front of the church with people that are seeking and they feel God's presence. And just because they feel God's presence, they immediately think, oh, well, God has forgiven me just because I feel his presence. But has uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 also taken place? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So if a person really comes into a right relationship with God Yes, God's Spirit is going to witness to us, but that's not just feeling His presence. There'll be a definite knowledge that God has saved us. That witness comes to our heart. 
Secondly, we will be a new creature in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Look at verse uh, uh, 9 and 10 out of 1 John. 1 John chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for a seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Uh, in this the children of God are manifested, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doth not righteousness, doeth not righteousness, is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brethren. So in other words, if we're truly born of God, the old sin life is going to pass away. We're not going to continue in sin. It's now, this is not saying that it's impossible for us to commit sin. But what this is saying is that with his seed living in us, with his seed remaining in us, we're not going to continue in sin. And I preached about this last night on the streets outside of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the road home. And uh, the, the illustration that I used was about a police officer. Now, if somebody had trouble uh, where, where they, were, they were stealing things, they were a thief, and they stood before the judge, and the judge uh, examined the person, and, and he's been found guilty, and he's standing before the judge, but it's the guy's first time getting caught. And he says to the, to the, uh, the, the thief, he says, all right, he said, um, I'll tell you what, we, we have this brand new program, and we know how to help you to, to never steal again. Are you willing to enroll in this program? And uh, so he says, well, uh, what, what do I have to do? He said, well... He said, uh, you, you've had a pattern of, of uh, being a, fe a thief. You know, you openly admitted that. We're grateful for that. Uh, and uh, that you were honest to, to admit that you had these, this problem. And so we have assigned a police officer to you every day of your life. And he's going to walk with you everywhere you go. No matter where you go, he's going to go with you. Now I got a question for you. If you're in the presence of a police officer, are you ever going to steal something? No, Why? Instant bust, right? Okay. Well, the same is true here. If it says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. So if Jesus Christ is living in us, he is with us everywhere we go. And we acknowledge that and realize that and keep that relationship alive and healthy. He doesn't depart from us. So we're not going to go back into sin because Jesus is near us all the time. It's like being with a police officer. You don't commit a crime while you're standing in front of a police officer, right? Well, when Jesus is living in us, where he's with us all the time. And that's the miracle gospel of Jesus Christ. So a summary of the things we talked about here today. A disciple is one who's brought under the control of Jesus. What, is it, uh, what does God expect of us? He expects us to be holy. And if he expects us to be holy, then he can help us to actually be that. He can help us to do that. What is sin? Sin is breaking God's law is number one. And secondly, sin is neglecting to do what is good, to do what is right. What does God think about just one sin? Well, if we're committing just one point of sin, according to God's word, we're guilty of all. Sin is so serious because sin is of the devil and the wages of sin is death. But glory be to God in this next thing here in summarizing. The gift of God is eternal life through salvation by Jesus Christ. Salvation is what? It's the deliverance from sin and its consequences. I should really underline deliverance from sin. Because, again, that's one of the things that, that, that is so missed in, in the modern-day uh, uh, Christianity, so to say. Deliverance from sin and its consequences and the coming to peace and reconciliation with God. How do we get right with God? Three basic steps. Confess, repent, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the results of truly coming and getting right with God are there's going to be fruits of a transformed life. And, uh, you know, God wants to, to help every one of us have that transformed life. We can't do that on our own. I testified about this on the street last night as well. You know, for, for, for months, I tried to clean up my act, and which is a good thing to do. We want to do everything that we can, but I couldn't get rid of all my sin. I couldn't give up every sin in my life. I, I, I would try, and I just kept failing. I remember I'd take my pack of cigarettes and throw them out the window and, uh, in my truck. By, meaning, by, by the way, throwing the pack of cigarettes out the truck while I was driving was also another sin. You know? But I was, I, was, I was trying to get rid of the cigarettes. I was trying to get rid of the, the dope I was smoking. I was trying to get rid of the booze I was drinking, and, and I just couldn't give it up. And I would tell God, I'd pray every night, Lord, forgive me, forgive me. But the next day, I'd just go do it again. I just felt so helpless. But when he really saved me, there was a transformed life. There was a new power to walk with God. And that new power to walk with God, I want to invite you to come back. And we're going to explore and learn about developing that solid walk with the Lord. 
And I went through a lot of trying experiences. I'll probably be sharing little parts of my testimony as I share about that. And then the last thing that we want to cover in this seminar is learning to walk closely with the Lord. You know, it's, it's one thing to, to find God and get right with God. It's another thing to walk with God in our own personal relationship. But then Jesus calls us to follow him. What does that mean? What does it mean to follow Jesus? Well, I want to invite you back for the next two nights. Tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. And then we'll conclude our seminar on Wednesday night. And uh, we trust to get into these items here. And trust the Lord will help us to uh, share that with each and every one.